in the course of this, um, please use the question feature. If I'm going too fast, I'm going to try to fit in a lot of tools um, fairly quickly. So slow me down. Um, if there's tools that you've used that you want to share, again, um, feel free to share. We can open this up um, into a forum type um, conversation at the end. Um, okay, so our, oh, let's see, it's not working for me. There we go. I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Um, so we're going to just do a quick review of the RainWise program. Um, I'm going to talk about how to design, particularly online right now. I think that's a, a nice tool to have as we're all waiting to get back out in the field. How to use the calculator and do some budgeting work to help kind of dial in your design and some things that can be difficult um, in the field. And again, forgive me while I try to figure out my accelerated Zoom skills here. This is good. So um, as Lauren said, this is a webinar produced by RainWise. And RainWise is a product of Seattle, Seattle Public Utilities and King County. And it's primarily dedicated to private property. So roof water in particular that can be captured in a cistern or a rain garden before it goes into the public domain. The goal is to try to um, take the peak off some of those big storms that we have. Uh, we all know about flattening the curve now and that's basically what we're trying to do with these installations. Your, um, your projects may include some roadside work, permeable pavement, other GSI features that are a great team to the RainWise rebate. Um, but for this, we're gonna be talking about particularly cisterns and stormwaters in the RainWise program um, that have a very specific set of codes. If you do design in other cities, it just has a different um, set of specs. Um, you'll notice that we have Spanish subtitles. This uh, presentation has been given in Spanish as well. If you are a Spanish speaker and you prefer to ask your questions in Spanish, um, we do not have, I don't believe we have a staff person today that is a Spanish speaker, but we could relay those questions and have those answered in Spanish if you prefer. Okay, so the goal is to take the peak off those big rain flows. And there is a lot of um, a lot of projects that combine to make a big effort and a big effect. So every house that can manage its rainwater on site adds to the collective good. Um, and we've seen in certain neighborhoods a lot of projects together combine and have lessened the overflows. So this is a, an amazing program that. Um, has been very effective here in Seattle. If you are a RainWise contractor, this is going to be familiar to you. Um, down at the bottom is a link and I'll show you how to find that. This is the design details that we use in the RainWise program. Um, they're very specific. They have a lot of things that will cause you some grief in the future, but we all have to follow these rules. Um, things like uh, setbacks, um, how drainage is going to move through the system. Um, number seven, give me some um, that I had to have a minimum head of three feet on a cistern and I had two foot nine inches. So spending time to get to know these specs is going to be very good idea, especially as you're getting started. But I also encourage you to, um, for the new contractors, to have the pre-inspection, spend some time with your inspector and ask these questions. They're going to find the things that you missed and, and things that can make your life easier in the future. All right, rain garden section. Um, you'll notice that there are some call outs right here. 
connection, see sheet three. So we're going to have other sheets that we'll look at for more details. Um, the thing that I want you guys to notice that this inflow is higher than the outflow. Sometimes that is a really difficult thing to achieve. Um, so knowing the specs for that, this other one, the three foot minimum to right away from the edge of your wing garden and the dispersion trench to the sidewalk, that can also be a little bit difficult to achieve. These are some of the things that we can figure out online, at least get started figuring them out. And this is the spec sheet for the cisterns. Again, it has a call out um, to other sheets to give you more information. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if people have questions about the spec sheet, we could throw those on at the end. Um, oh, actually, here's a question opportunity right now. Okay. I don't see any questions, so I think we can okay. just move on for now. Okay. Um, all right. So, roof. Um, some site that we um, we have all specifications online uh, to those and look at them. Um, we can have conversations with our homeowners and find out what they're looking for. Do they want a rain garden? Do they want a cistern? Do they have very specific things that they want you to fulfill? Um, some of the aesthetic choices, there's a lot of great plant information online. Um, you can look at options for um, build, building trellises or hardscape, et cetera. You can create online shopping carts at the box stores and do some budgeting there. So um, I've been in the course of doing more projects, doing a lot of this work um, before I even go to the site. Um, especially in this climate, I do almost all of the work before I go to the site, but I have saved so much time and effort by doing some of this um, before I go, and then the budget. So we can also do some pricing, look at what some options are. Oh, and I'm sorry, Shannon, uh, the internet connection where I'm at has been a little bit funky. Um, I will slow down and see if I can't get it to work a little bit better. Okay, um, I'm gonna back it up one second. I think I skipped something. There we go, I did, okay. So the site information, um, we're going to look at how to see if your property is eligible for rainwise. Um, and those are the properties that are within the CSO basins that are highest priority. We're going to go to the King County IMAP, which is a really wonderful tool that can give you a lot of information about your site and you can measure your roof and some of the setbacks. We're going to look at the side sewer card so you know where your connection points will be. Uh, Google Earth, we're going to check out how to get street view. You can see a lot of information such as downspouts and also setbacks, some land use. Um, opportunities and of course the site visit and homeowner meeting. I have actually had homeowner meetings using Google Earth where the homeowner and I are traveling virtually around their front yard and it's it's been kind of a cool tool um, and yes I did not have to drive across town to do it. So um, we're gonna go to contractor resources. Not flipping through this. I'm gonna go back to home this is the website that has everything that we need to do our job. So the first page is check your eligibility. Um, some homeowners are eligible in Seattle and some are not. I'm going to type in an address of a home that was kind enough to let us use their house for a class project once. And it says, congratulations, 
we are eligible for a rain garden and the system. So sometimes you will see that you are not eligible. And again, that's you are probably not in um, a rebated area. Maybe that's coming soon, or maybe there are options and grants that are available to you. Um, you might see that you're eligible for cistern to side sewer only. That might mean that you're in an area that has uh, mapped soils that are poor infiltration. You might be on a slope. Um, and it's just deemed that it's not a good rain garden site. If you think that your site is a good rain garden site and you want to go into further investigation, it could be that you're on the edge of one of those mapped areas. So you could talk to your inspector. It has happened that that determination has changed based on the site and the area that it was at. But typically, um, this is, is gonna be pretty accurate. Um, all right, the next thing I like to do is go to IMAP. If you haven't used this tool, it's a pretty wonderful one. You can find out all sorts of information. I do a lot of restoration work, so I use this one a lot. There we go. So we type in our address. Okay, and I'm going to kind of go through this fairly quickly. If you haven't used this tool, again, you can ask me some questions. Um, so here is our property. You can also get the parcel um, information. You want to zoom in. Here it is. We can go up to this and get our base map. You can also, interestingly, if you look to the bottom, you can get historic maps, which are really interesting too, especially if you can't figure out what's happening on the site. Sometimes that can give you some clues. You might be, all right, let's get this over a little bit. Where's our house? We lost it. There we go. Okay, let's close that. This is a layer list. Um, this is one I use more in restoration, but this is also things that I've used in, in rain wise. For example, the elevation contours can be really handy. If you have a house that's on a slope and you're trying to figure out um, is a site that you're thinking about building a rain garden uphill or downhill, you can pull on these contours and it'll give you a lot of information. ESOs, um, landside hazards, steep slope, etc. cetera. Um, IMAP's just wonderful. You can just spend hours going through all these little sub layers. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna use it to measure. So here's our house. Um, just from the top view, it looks like it's in two sections. Um, let's measure it. So here's our measure tool. Measure simple. This is a linear measurement. If you want to measure, for example, let's say from the house to the fence, this is a number that you're going to want to have. It's about six feet. It's fairly accurate. This isn't perfect, but you can get pretty close. So we have a little bit of distance between the house and the fence. That's good to know. Um, we then can go to square feet. And this will be the tool where you can measure area. So square feet, sometimes it'll be in meters, so check that. And you just basically draw a shape around the house. I'm going to do a quick measure on this, these two shapes that we see. Um, and we're going to use these numbers later, so 663. Okay, let's measure the other side of the house. And I'm just using this as a shade map. Um, and how measure that will figure out where the is measuring. You'll see there. There we go. And that connection is unstable. So forgive me if I block out again. Yes. Can you just repeat the last thing that you said, Roseanne? it did cut out. Oh, okay. Um, 
I was saying that frequently what I will do is, you know, I'll get a kind of an understanding of the roof and I'm using the shade map. You can see that the two, this by the shade on the roof, that it's a different section. I will also use this tool and have an understanding of the length Okay. Um, the next tool that I like to use is Google Earth. And here is our house. Um, let's see if I can get it to do a 2D view. It is fighting me for some reason. Oh, I have a question. Um, so the question, Tom, is, is there, what is the requirement for a setback from property lines to allow pedestrian movement? It was three feet. Yes. And um, so you want to have the ability to have whatever you build, that you put a cistern on the side of a house, you need three foot between um, the facility and the fence or the next property. So when I said we had five and a half feet, for example, if you use a slimline cistern and it's two foot one, and then you still have three feet for that egress. Um, and that is one that a inspector will call out right away. That's the first thing that they'll measure. But you can, using the online tool, kind of get, get that answer before you go. Some, some sites it'll be very specific and you have like three inches of room and you might wanna take it. Um, and I do not know, friends, why. There we go. Okay, so it'll come into 2D. And this is a good place to measure. You'll notice that there's a measurement tool here. A lot of people use Google Earth to do all their measurements. Um, I'm just an old school IMAP user. So um, your tools, your preference. The 3D viewer is really nice. Let's go ahead and zoom in. 3D Viewer is really great for trying to figure out what is happening with your roof. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand, um, you know, especially like with this roof, where is it flowing to? Sometimes you can spend a lot of time on the ground. So um, this 3D Viewer is really nice. Um, you can also start, start to figure out where some of the gutters are. It looks like this house is probably, the way the flow pattern is, it's gonna have a gutter on each of these corners or sorry, a downspot on each of these corners. Um, the other option is to look at street view. So you go ahead and click on the street. And this one's been really nice, especially right now, to try to get a sense of happening. So here's our house, and it looks like my internet connection's a little slow. Roseanne, are you sure. able to move as close to your router and modem as possible? Uh, I just, I've noticed that everybody's been working at home. We all just kind of fizzle out sometimes. It's more of a bandwidth problem, I think. Mm -hmm. So okay. again, I apologize. So Google Earth has been really helpful for me to do things like see that there's a lot of uh, boxes and gas lines and probably water lines happening on the side of this house. We also have some windows. We have two downspouts happening here as well. I look at this side of the house and I immediately sort of dismiss it as a possibility. We don't have a lot of room and we have gas lines. We always like to avoid things like gas lines. Um, it looks like the yard is raised. One of the specs says that you need to um, be able to be within 18 inches of a fall. So you don't want to have the outflow of your rain garden fall more than 18 inches. Um, we'll look at this side of the house. Yep, we do have downspouts over here. And you can use this view to kind of go all the way around the house. And if there aren't trees, you can get a really nice clear view. So I'm going to pop back over here 
And um, were there any questions of using those online tools? Tom just had a follow up about, you know, where's that spec stated that um, you guys were talking the about before, the requirement for the setback. Oh my goodness. Um, somewhere in those specs. So let's pop over here to, um, if we go all the way to the bottom of this, the 700 million gallons website, there's a contractor resources. And this is where all the stuff we need is. Marking materials, this is great. Um, multiple language materials, this is really nice for homeowners and committees. All the rebate paperwork. Um, that you're going to need to fill out in particular before the rainwise construction begins. You can um, do a lot of this uh, work with your homeowner now. Um, financial support options, um, vendor payment option if homeowners don't have the money up front and you're willing to cover it. Craft 3. Um, I've used Craft 3 for some of my big roof projects. It's a really wonderful program. I'm happy to talk about that more if anyone has questions. And here are your design resources. So design details for rain gardens and cisterns. Um, also just above it, the rebate calculator. So here is where you find all of that information. Um, I am not entirely sure where in the manual that spec is. You'll have to forgive me. I um, have been doing this for a minute and I don't always remember. But I will say this, that um, this gets changed from time to time and updated, so it's always worth keeping an eye on it. Um, it's gonna be in one of these, uh, Thomas, one of these setback plans. Um, I'm not entirely sure which one, forgive me. I hope that helps you kind of have to comb through it for a minute. And I will say that sometimes, the piece of, pieces of instruction will be on page three and the other pieces of instructions will be on page five, seven, and nine. Um, and it's your responsibility to find all of them. Um, they tried, I think, very hard to make these usable, but it's a lot of information in a lot of different places. So I hope that helps um, without answering your question, actually. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Here's uh, some of that retaining wall information, that 18 inches that I mentioned. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so sizing calculations. Um, the, the whole program is engineered in such a way that um, contributing area is your roof. How much roof water can you get into a facility? Um, the rain garden sizing is based on the bottom. We like to think of it as a bathtub. So the number that we are gonna calculate will be the bottom of the rain garden. That's the infiltration area that's flat. Um, the area around it is the side slope and the berm. So typically that's gonna be around three foot on the outside in each direction. So your rain garden can frequently be twice the size of your bottom area. And you can make that assumption. Um, so when you're looking at the size of a yard from an online tool, do you have enough room potentially to build a rain garden? That's one of the things that you can figure out. And the cistern capacity is from your outflow. This is the pipe, the overflow pipe, um, and your low flow pipe. So that area between is your cistern capacity. Um, the low flow orifice, uh, quarter inch is very standard. The three eighths and half inch is typically found in a big roof project. So anyone who's working for um, on a church or a community center or school or a very, very large house might run into those numbers. And there's a special calculator for that. Okay, here is our house again. So um, 
we are looking at our side sewer card, which says that right along the side of the house where those gas lines were are also where our connection points are. Kind of inconvenient because that would be a great spot for a cistern. It's really nice when you can just cut the downspout and stick a cistern in, but it does not look like we're going to have some good options here. Um, we do have that nice big front yard. We also have a gas line running down that property line. So you're going to want to have um, all of those utilities mapped always, always have those utilities mapped, but in the site you know that there's a gas line. You do not want to mess with that. Find out where the water line is as well. This, um, this house, I will say, had um, a remodel. So that roof was lifted, so I was, um, given the glorious opportunity to know exactly where the gas and water line were and to find out that this back of the house which had had flooding problems was connected to the side sewer. So now I know that I have a live side sewer connection right here. Um, this is the part of the exercise where we would usually do it together so forgive me I'm going to tell you what we did. Um, we put a cistern here there's that distance to the fence. We had um, basically four foot outside of our two foot cistern. We put a flat cistern here. And then we had enough room for them to walk around with a wheelbarrow. We put a rain garden here because we had access to the street and the sidewalk. The trick with rain wise, I think more so than in other cities is how do you get water to side sewer, an alley, or a sidewalk. That can be really, really challenging. So um, I think I spend more time trying to figure that piece out than almost anything else. Um, yeah, so rain garden up here, cistern right here. So I'm gonna run these calculations. Uh, square feet A is this um, front side here. And the square foot B is going to be that backside that we're going to send to the rain garden. Um, and I'm going to pull up the calculator. All right, can everybody see that? I'm going to assume yes. So here's the rebate calculator. Let's calculate that first cistern area. Um, I measured it earlier, it might be a slightly different number, but we're just gonna say that it's 624. We're gonna type in that we are building a cistern. We are gonna say that we're doing one cistern. And this drop-down menu has a couple of different cisterns. Um, it's, it's calculated for a brand called Bushman's that's usually pretty easy to find here in, in Seattle. There's a couple of contractors that are distributors. You can get them from the Conservation Corps. I use, I frequently use a different company called Premier. They're in BC. They can be tricky to get. I just happen to like the tanks. So um, for the sense of this exercise, we're just gonna go ahead and use Bushman and kind of look at what the different sizes do to the rebate. So 205 is a small round tank. Um, it is 79% of the rebate, and that has to do with the capacity, how much water is coming in to the cistern, and what is the efficiency? That's going to be the percentage. So it's 1,900. Um, what do we have for the 265? That's one of the slim. Um, low profile cisterns, bumps it up a bit. Um, and this is what I'm looking at, by the way, everyone, this total rebate. And 420, okay, 84%. And 530, okay, not a big change. So it looks like, depending on what you wanna install, there's not a real big difference between these cisterns, between the 530, which is 2100, and the 205, which is 19. Well, I would say that the efficiency here is pretty good. Um, I want you guys to look again at this 420 though. Um, pretty close to the 530. The difference here is what the homeowner wants. Some homeowners want to uh, 
water their garden and they're really into storage. So you might want a bigger tank for them. Some people just want to participate and the small tank is just fine. Okay, I'm going to go back to the presentation unless anyone has any questions about how to use a calculator. Mm, one quick thing I want to do actually is to calculate the rain garden. So that one was 703. Or am I doing this backwards? Okay, 703 rain garden. The infiltration rate at the site is one. Actually, it was about six inches an hour. Um, so all rain gardens are $4 a square foot. The only way to make that number bigger is to have a bigger contributing area. That's a fixed number. So when you're designing this and you're going to put in a rain garden, it's in your favor to put in as big of a rain garden as you can. Um, or get as much contributing area to the rain garden and that's going to increase um, your rebate. If you have a small area and you want to get to that $4 a square foot, one thing you can do is do a cistern to rain garden. Um, we're going to add, we'll do one inch. We're going to say we're going to do two, one cistern, probably a 205. So our rain garden size is now 11 square foot, which is smaller and we're still at $4. So playing with this, going back and forth with the different sizing, and um, I have increased my rebate a couple thousand dollars, and on this house I'm gonna show you, I did actually increase my rebate a lot um, by playing with this calculator and finding out um, how I could change the design to max that out. This homeowner was interested in having um, the installation fall within the rebate, and we were able to do that. Okay, so that was a rebate calculator. This is an old um, presentation, so please don't quote me on the costs. Um, but this will the costs are probably in the framework. They've probably gone up somewhat. Um, we were looking at the 205 as the smallest, and the 530 is the largest. These are very typical cisterns. The 660 is a pretty big tank that you might see for a bigger roof. Some people like to put it under their decks, actually. It's kind of short. Um, but these four are the most typical. But what I wanted you to see was the difference in price. So the rebate was about the same, more or less, between the 420 and the 530. But look at the price difference. Um, People really like these flat slimline uh, cisterns, but they are significantly more expensive. So what I'll usually do is um, offer, offer the opportunity um, for the choice to be made by the homeowner um, and let them pick. They might choose to go with the 530 and the increased price because that's the, that's the model that they want. Um, you could do potentially a very similar job with the other cisterns because that efficiency rate wasn't changing too much. Um, so here's what we built. I have a gutter contractor who is a magician and he was able to get this house to really move. And what he did was reset my gutters to go in the direction of the rain garden. And you can't always do this. You need uh, just the right kind of a roof and some kind of gutter magic, whether you have it or you hire someone to do it. He was able to bring a good chunk of the roof to this section. So I was able to get that couple thousand rain garden rebate to be a lot higher. And then I was still in the 80s, uh, the 80 percent for the cistern, so I was able to put a cistern here. And that worked out really well. So I couldn't quite build it in the rebate when I split the roof in half like this. So by having someone come out and do it, even the cost of having that subcontractor worked, so it was definitely worth trying to figure that out. And so what we did is we capped the other downspouts so those are closed off and taken off and all the water is routed here. Any questions? 
Okay. Um, I borrowed these from another presentation, but these are things that we've seen. Um, there's a lot of things that we've seen in our practice of doing maintenance. So Dirt Core, we do a lot of design build, um, particularly with big roof projects and churches and community spaces, but we also do a lot of community maintenance. So we have gone out to older installations and fixed things, um, pipes that were broken or things that were clogged or just tried to figure out what was happening. And, you know, these are installations that need maintenance. They aren't build it and walk away. Frequently they need some, some help and intervention to keep working and then sometimes they also need a little bit of a redesign. So one thing that we see a lot is that the outlet, this bathtub is actually higher than the inlet. A lot, amazingly. I don't know if the, the, parameters were too tight that the garden had settled or something had changed, but the water goes back to the house. This is a big problem. Um, and so you'll start to see some flooding. Um, making sure that when you build something that you have a really clear elevation in your favor is going to make your life a lot easier. You're not going to get that middle of the night call that none of us want to get. Um, sometimes you will look at the side sewer map and there's a side sewer there that's great but when you go to the house you'll see that it's clogged you can dig it out um, it could trigger a side sewer permit which you could do yourself or you could hire a sewer side sewer professional or you could um, have a beautiful design that works perfectly minus the side sewer connection so you might have to figure out how to move that facility and or um, reroute your outflow back to a connection, um, either to the street, another side sewer, or an alley. Um, and that's where it starts to get tricky. Um, Roseanne, Caitlin was wondering if you could go back two slides to the project summary page. This one? Caitlin, was there anything specific that okay. you wanted her to go over? She just wanted to take a look at the graphics. Okay. So one thing I wanted to point at, um, we could have gone a lot of different directions with this design. These um, four point peaked roofs are really tricky actually they're they're very difficult because if you remember earlier i mentioned that um you needed 400 square foot one particular um triangle of this roof is probably going to be less than 400 square feet so you know when you look at a roof like that that you're going to have to capture two sections which means probably that you're going to have to tilt a gutter or tilt yeah you're gonna to have to tilt a gutter and probably take off a downspout and or you're going to have to pipe a downspout to your facility. Um, the smaller roofs that are built like this can be a bit challenging. I've seen um, some gutter contractor or some con contractors leave the gutters alone and just pipe underneath the gutters um, if they had enough clearance above windows. Some homeowners are okay with that. Some home homeowners don't like the look of it. So um, figuring out how to get the water to your facility is um, part of the design challenge. Were there any other questions? Does anybody have any um, tools that they've used that we could share with the group, other online diagnostic tools to get the, a lot of the work done before they go on site? Okay. 
Do you want to talk about how you work with inspectors to make your projects work and mm -hmm. how they've helped you get more of a rebate or make the project work better? Mm -hmm. I had um, a project. It was uh, a big roof project. And I was a very young contractor at the time and um, I had a really great opportunity for rain garden, but the inflow and the outflow were literally the same elevation. My constriction on that site was the sidewalk. You can't change the sidewalk and I couldn't change the building. And I really couldn't change the elevation. It was a super flat plane. Um, and so that inspector worked with me to um, build a rain garden on a site that didn't quite have the elevation that was required. And I had to do some extra things to make that a safe facility. So in that one instance, that spec was slightly waived and I had to build a bigger berm and be very specific about the levels of that berm to make that happen. Um, other times I've had a really tight space where I couldn't quite get the dispersion trench exactly in the right spot so I had to be creative um, and I was able to slightly adjust it to make that work so that the uh, specs were met. And I've actually thrown up my project as an open question. You know, it's not the inspector's job to design your project, but they have so much experience that I have, um, when I was really stuck, thrown out two or three options and had the inspector walk through the project with me and then together we came up with an entirely different option. Um, having a good relationship with your inspector is amazing. Um, they're busy people, they don't have time to design the project with you, but if you have very specific questions and challenges, they will work through them with you. Did you want more detail, Lauren, or did that help? Oh, that's great. Um, how do you contact the inspectors, like before the pre-inspection or mm -hmm. before the post-inspection? So the pre-inspection email, I believe, goes to, I think it's just inspection request to SPU, forgive me. I, it, it goes to someone who then routes it to an inspector. So you will be assigned an inspection. When I have a question, you know, I, I think the Rainwise staff, staff might have to answer this. I have a direct line to the inspector that I work with all the time. So sometimes when I have a very specific project question, I just reach out to her. Um, but the official channel is that um, inspection request um, email. And then it's routed to the correct staff because the basins are split between King County and SPU. Um, you will have different inspectors for each basin. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think you have a couple slides left, right? I think that was it. I the, talked um, faster than I normally do. The St. Luke's slide. Oh, the St. Luke's slide. Where are we? Thank you, Lauren. Um, so this is uh, was one of our first projects as Dirt Core, and it was a project that was built by students. If you've gone through the contractor training, it's very likely that you've seen this facility. Um, it's a really great uh, site to go to because we've learned a lot since then. And it's interesting to hear how people would have addressed the design challenges in a different way. Um, when we're all allowed back outside, maybe we can do a tour and have that conversation. But um, this was a really, interesting campus because it was so big. It's just an enormous campus and it had a lot of really cool opportunities. So this first slide with the big green tank, that's actually, that roof is, oh gosh, around 3,000 square feet. And that's a 2,000 gallon cistern. Um, that it's really rare to have that much space, but we were able to put a 2,000 gallon cistern there. And that, that cistern actually helps irrigate the back half of the property. The next slide is three 4,000 gallon cisterns. 
Um, they had this space um, in between buildings that I wasn't blocking windows. It was this drop space by a basement that we were able to put these extraordinarily huge cisterns in. And we had to rebuild the entire outflow. It's going to six inch pipe and it was quite a process, but um, with those cisterns, they're able to irrigate most of their property well into August. They just attach a pump to it and it has four buildings going to it. Um, that was a really cool design and we were really happy to build it. Another one, this little tank here. Remember I mentioned in the very beginning how this three foot height was a problem. This is the cistern that was two foot nine and it actually did not meet specs. I was get granted a special reprieve on that one because I actually did not know that spec at the time. So there's a kindness of an inspector because it's still functioning. It's still capturing a high percentage of um, efficiency. It was just one inch short. So we wiggled the outflow a little bit and was able to get a bit more, but that one was a special reprieve. This is an 800 gallon cistern that actually tucks up under the building. Um, the church didn't want a giant cistern there. They're very proud of their facilities, but for whatever reason, this is the front of the church, so we tucked it up under, so it sticks under a little bit. Again, this is the top view of those cisterns. You can see that it's coming from several different places on the roof. The church actually has beehives up here, which is very cool. Um, one interesting thing that happened with the beehives is that the beehives have pollen, and the pollen has fines, and so I got a call from the rector whose office is right here that water was shooting out the tops of the cisterns. And so I rushed down, this was a couple years after it had been built, um, and uh, found out that the filters, which are giant on these cisterns, was filled with pollen fines. So I, I keep my relationship with my clients for a long time. I'm around for them if they have questions. It might be a good opportunity to set up a long-term maintenance relationship because they, they are gonna call you when something goes wrong um, and unexpected things like honeybee pollen, who you really can't think of in advance. And this is just a really typical uh, roof to low flow and then it runs along the house. This one actually runs out to the street or it could potentially run along the house out to a side sewer. So each of these situations was a little different and we used a different way of approaching an installation on that same campus. And the campus also has a giant rain garden, which incidentally was that rain garden that we also got a reprieve for the elevation and the outflows. Um, the specs have been um, very consistent. You know, those gardens, and particularly you can see it with the big roof gardens, so much water. I have storm chased at a new facility. Um, those big first storms right after you install it and make all the connections and you get one of those pineapple expresses of a couple inches in a couple days and you run out to your your installation and you check and you know the the cisterns are flowing. The overflow might be engaged but they're going and it's working really well. Um, you know you might have to check and make sure that you don't get that first flush of moss to clog your filter, but then you can start to get a read of how often you need to have that filter cleaned out so you can inform your homeowner. They have a particularly mossy roof or a lot of trees. Um, you know, the rain gardens might fill right up to the top of the outflow, um, but they've been very consistent and reliable. And even if I build a, facility in Everett or Kirkland or somewhere else in King County, I almost always use RainWise specs as my guidance, even though they might have the Western Washington sizing. I almost always rely on these specs because they've proven to be um, risk adverse and safe. So um, it's been a good program to work with. All right, I see there is another question and we're almost out of time, so I wanna make sure we get to that. And Lauren, I can't see the questions, unfortunately. Sure. 
So it says, Alexandria is wondering, the bottom right corner photo is the ground level under the, under the cistern. Is there no need for a base? Oh, hey, how are you doing there? Um, no, it's on a flat level surface. It's on concrete. So um, the bases on these, the big cistern here, is on ground you know so when we were talking about these giant cisterns we also had to make sure that it was on a stable base we you can't put the, these on a platform um this was a we dug a hole basically and built a base so the base on this is subsurface oh um in fact i don't think we built a base on any of these so this one is on concrete and it was level so that worked um, if it's concrete and it's not level, then you have to build a base. Thank you. All right, so it looks like we are just about a, out of time. Um, Roseanne, do you want to put it on the last slide that has your contact information? So if anyone has any follow-up questions, make sure to email Roseanne, uh, roseanne at thedirtcourt.com. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is our first um, contractor skill building webinar that we've done. Thank you to Roseanne. We have another webinar that is next Friday with Jake Harris of Stone Soup Gardens. It's going to kind of detail um, you know, cisterns and how to do like an a cistern installation, um, well, to give you as much information as we can virtually. Um, and also, I just want to point out that there's a survey that should pop up at the end when I end the meeting or when you leave the meeting uh, right now. And please make sure to fill that out. I'll also send out an email to everyone with some links to a recording of this webinar and also. Um, just a couple other resources that Roseanne mentioned in the presentation today. So yeah. Thank you everyone. Um, yes, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. We frequently open our sites up to question and answer sessions if there's a, a piece of design that you want to see in action, especially for new contractors. Um, we are a teaching group and we're really committed to being available and thank you alexandra all right thanks so much Thanks, Roseanne. Great job.